Hi everybody! First let me start by saying that this video is long and dry, but informative. If that wasn't what you were looking for, then Kai Wong's channel is right down the block. In this video I'll walk you through every single menu item in the a7R 3 and tell you briefly and accurately what it does. As luck would have it, the a7 III has also been released, so we know the menus are all but identical. I think it's safe to assume that the same will be true of the S3 when it releases. Note that YouTube isn't my day job, it isn't even my night job. This is what I do to break up the monotony, so while I may not post often, I try to make sure that what I do post is as useful as possible. If that appeals to you, then subscribe below, and if it doesn't, then subscribe out of spite. For those of you who are Sony users, there are three resources on the PhotonArmy.com website that might interest you. We have a complete list of every E-mount lens that has ever been made uh, in a searchable, filterable, sortable list uh, so you can find exactly what you need. Uh, we also have a guide on Sony lens adapters that includes every unique variety. And uh, also there's a guide to the best accessories, in my opinion, which gets updated as my opinions change. Now, for those of you thinking of going to Sony, let me set your expectations. Uh, Sony does some amazing things, but user interface has never, and is not currently, one of them. Um, here, this is a stereo remote from 1995, and you'll see as we walk through the menus of the camera that they have more in common with this than anything from the current millennium. That's a sacrifice we all make for the benefits these cameras provide, and that said, let's do this. All right, so this camera has been reset to factory defaults, so the menus are exactly what you would see out of the box. Uh, you can see that there are six tabs, and each tab is broken into many pages. Each set of pages is generally categorized around a, a, a common theme. In this case, uh, we've got quality and image size. And we'll start with file format. File format, you have three options, RAW, JPEG, and RAW plus JPEG. If you're satisfied with letting the camera decide how to process your images, you can certainly go with JPEG. If, on the other hand, you want to preserve as much image information as possible for later processing, select RAW. You can also record RAW and JPEG, so if you need instant gratification as well as the need to edit later, RAW plus JPEG is there for you. I generally shoot with RAW and JPEG. RAW file type. RAW files are huge because they contain information you can't readily see. Using compressed limits your RAW files to 12 bits per pixel, but that limits how much detail you can recover from shadows and highlights. Uncompressed RAWs are 14 bit, but this doubles the file size to 80 megs per image. In a controlled environment, compressed RAWs are probably all one would ever need, but in the messy real world I've already saved a few images by digging deep into some badly exposed shots. I'd rather have the data and not need it than the other way around. JPEG quality. This is one of those settings left over from the days storage and processing power came at a true premium. Unless you're using these as thumbnails for your RAWs, or perhaps samples for your clients, I can't think of too many reasons to lower this from extra fine. JPEG image size. Large, medium, and small are the options, uh, corresponding to 42 megapixels, 18 megapixels, and 11 megapixels. As with JPEG quality, you may have an edge case for small images, but the vast majority of people will leave this set to large. RAW files are always the full 42 megapixels. Aspect ratio. The native aspect ratio of the camera is 3 by 2, so 16 by 9 is actually just a crop of the full size image. And by the way, this will affect both your RAWs and your JPEGs. Lenses that are designed for the smaller APS-C size sensors produce an image circle that doesn't usually cover a full-frame sensor. Sony was wise enough to let the camera detect when an APS-C lens is attached to the camera and crop your images for you. The result is an 18 megapixel image instead of 42 megapixels. I'm going to leave this setting on auto and then switch to an APS-C size lens to show you the result. So now we have the APS-C sized 18-105 attached to the camera, and um, it looks completely normal. However, you'll see that this is only because the camera has automatically detected that it's an APS-C size lens. You'll notice now that at the top there's a solid rectangle inside a dotted rectangle little icon. That is the indication that you are in APS-C mode, um, and you may also be able to tell by the fact that it says 18 megapixels up at the very top. Also, you'll notice that JPEG image size now limits large to 18 megapixels, medium becomes 11, and small becomes 4.5. 
Long exposure noise reduction is an effect that is applied to both RAWs and JPEGs uh, with exposures lasting one second or longer. Pro is that you get some automatic noise reduction, that's cool, but uh, the con is that it takes two pictures. So if you run a five minute exposure, the camera is going to take another five minute exposure in order to analyze and check for uh, hot pixels and uh, sensor dust and things like that to remove. So that can consume a lot of time if you've got some particularly long exposures. Most people leave this off, I leave it off, but if you're taking some normal pictures of waterfalls and you have some time to kill, this can save you some time in post. High ISO noise reduction only applies to JPEGs and contrary to the name, it does apply at all ISOs. So you have a choice of low or normal. Personally, I find that normal applies the effect too harshly and so I would never use anything more than low. Color space. This setting, again, only applies to JPEGs. Adobe RGB is a wider color space than sRGB. However, in order to make use of it, all of the devices in your workflow chain have to speak Adobe RGB. If they don't, then the resulting colors will be muted. I would suggest that there isn't much reason to have this set to anything but sRGB. The people who need a wider gamut tend to shoot raw and the average consumer looking at your image will not have an Adobe RGB display. That said, there are some pros who shoot only JPEG, but unless you're 100% sure that your entire workflow is Adobe RGB compliant, I wouldn't use it. Lens compensation. This setting lets the camera apply corrections for known lens characteristics. For example, the Sony 24 to 105 has a predictable amount of vignette, distortion, and aberration. The camera knows this and applies digital compensation for those issues. This will only affect JPEGs. However, you can apply the same corrections to RAWs by converting them with the Sony Image Data Converter. Other programs like Lightroom can automatically apply lens corrections in post. I tend to leave this to auto. In practice, you'll typically select your drive mode with one of the physical buttons or the function menu, but you can also set it here if you have a burning desire. We'll cover the shooting modes and bracketing in a different video, but you have the option of single shooting, four levels of continuous, three self-timer settings, six continuous self-timer settings, and a bunch of bracketing settings. The a7R 3 will do single and continuous exposure, white balance, or dynamic range brackets. Sadly, there's no focus bracketing, which would have been nice. For those not familiar with bracketing, it is a method of combining multiple images taken at different settings into a final image that captures more color and detail than a single image would. In bracket settings, you can configure the delay between shots using the self-timer and set your bracket order. Again, we'll cover that in a different video, but this setting basically determines if you want to start your bracket series with a properly exposed shot or start with the lowest settings and then ramp up. Pixel Shift Multi-Shooting Pixel Shift is a new feature in the a7R 3 that is similar to bracketing. The camera takes four images, shifting the sensor by just one pixel between shots. Sony provides software that stitches those four images together into a single image with improved sharpness. This process requires the camera to be absolutely dead steady, so this option allows you to change the timer delay between shots, hopefully avoiding any motion that would otherwise damage a final image. Memory Recall. This option will only be active if your camera is set to one of the three custom setting modes, one, two, or three on the mode dial. This allows you to load the settings associated with the mode you're in or any settings that you have saved to your SD card. This gets confusing, so I'll explain that in a moment. The a7R 3 lets you save sets of custom settings to the camera's memory. These custom settings can be accessed when you turn the mode dial to the corresponding number. Once you have your camera set the way you want it, you come into this menu option, navigate to the memory slot you want to save those settings to, and hit enter. Now, if you want to switch to the corresponding mode on the dial, you'll come to a screen that lets you load those settings. But wait, there's more. There's also four memory slots preceded with an M. These settings are saved to your SD card and can be accessed from any of the three memory modes or through the memory recall option we previously looked at. Now, that's all fine and dandy until you format your card in the camera or not. So if you want to use these settings, I would recommend backing them up. Uh, they are located in a folder in your SD card called private slash Sony slash settings slash 7RM3N um, and they will be named CamPro01 through 04.dat. 
Unfortunately, this is not a text file, so you can't edit it. But if you have these files backed up, then you can transfer your settings to multiple cameras or even get your settings back after a system reset. Since the A7R3 has two card slots, the Select Media option tells the camera which card to save the four memory recall sets to. You can have recall sets on both cards, but you'll only be able to access the sets from the card chosen here at any one time. Register Custom Shoot Set is cool, and I use this a lot. A custom shoot set is like a temporary memory recall that only overrides your settings while you're holding a particular button down. Let's say you're shooting at 1 60th shutter with a low ISO to get some beauty shots. Then someone stumbles and you want to shoot a few high shutter speed shots to catch the action without motion blur. You can assign a button to a custom hold set so that while you're holding that button, your shutter speed automatically changes to 1 1000th and your ISO switches to auto. This is one of those things that makes me wish there were more buttons on the camera. So we'll hop into Recall Custom Hold 1. In here you can check off the options you want to override and what values you'd like for those settings. You can also import the current settings. Note that there are relatively few options, but they are the most important. Once you have things set the way you want, simply hit Register. In order to actually use those settings, you have to assign it to a button, and we'll talk about that shortly. Focus Mode is one of those things you'll typically control with the camera's physical buttons, but you can set it here as well. Briefly, AFS is single shot autofocus. The camera will find focus once and stop unless you engage the focus again. AFC will continuously autofocus while the shutter button is halfway down, or if you're using back button focus. AFA for automatic will try to decide which focus method to use based on the camera's logic and how much motion it's detecting. Digital manual focus is like single shot, but allows you to make fine adjustments with the focus ring after focus has been established. This is typically used in macro work and shots where depth of field is extremely shallow. Manual focus is self-explanatory. Priority set in either AFS or AFC works the same way. When you press a shutter button, if the camera has not found focus yet, it will either favor taking the picture immediately or favor waiting for focus based on this setting. Focus area, again, will typically be adjusted by the physical buttons or function menu, but you can set it here as well. Focus modes are a deep subject, and I'll cover that in another video. Focus setting lets you adjust the current position of your focus point with the directional pad as long as your focus area is neither set to wide or center. Oddly, you cannot adjust it with your finger, even if touch control is enabled. To move the focus point with your finger, you need to be in a regular shooting mode, and touch control needs to be enabled. Switch Vertical Horizontal AF Area. This one can be hard to visualize, but if you switch from landscape to portrait orientation, this feature tries to move your current AF point or area to where your subject should be in the new orientation. It's not an intelligent feature, it's just rotating your focus points to roughly correspond with your new orientation. I prefer to keep this on for both AF point and AF area. AF illuminator is that little orange light that comes on in low light to help you focus. You can turn that on or off. I tend to keep it off. Center lock on autofocus will allow you to track a subject you choose by putting the center autofocus point over it and hitting the center button. If touch is enabled, you can select a subject anywhere on the screen by tapping on it. You can also disable lock on AF by touching the little X icon that appears. Personally, I don't use this in photography modes, but it is pretty useful in video. Set face priority in autofocus tells the camera to favor focusing on faces, while the face detect frame display draws a frame around the detected faces. I personally keep both of these on. Autofocus track sensitivity determines how quickly the tracking will refocus when it loses the subject behind another object. If your subject is moving behind trees and this is set too high, there's a great probability that the camera will refocus on the tree rather than picking your subject back up on the other side. On the other hand, if it's too low, then the camera may fail to quickly focus on a new subject that enters the frame. I tend to change this periodically, but by default I keep it at standard. AF system only applies to owners of the LAEA1 or LAEA3 adapters. These adapters allow you to mount Sony A or Minolta Maxim lenses to your E-mount camera. This option lets you choose whether you want to use phase detection or contrast detection when using the adapter. Phase detection is better under normal circumstances, but doesn't cover as much of the sensor as contrast detection, and contrast detection can work in more extreme scenarios. 
AF with shutter determines whether the camera focuses when the shutter button is pressed halfway down. If you want to do back button focus, then this needs to be turned off. I typically turn this off because I use back button focus, but since most people don't, I'm going to leave this on for now. Pre-AF. The camera has the ability to continuously attempt focus without you telling it to. That can be very convenient, but it can also go hunting when you least expect it. At the same time, it will use more power since the lens is constantly in motion. I tend to leave this off. iStart AF is only for users of the LAEA2 or LAEA4 adapters and instructs the lens to start focusing when your eye is against the viewfinder. AF Area Registration allows you to save the location of a focus area for quick recall when assigned to a custom button. It does not work with lock on AF, nor when touch to focus is active. I tend to leave this off because I'm either using touch to focus or other focus method. Delete registered AF area deletes the AF area we would have set in the previous setting. AF Auto Clear allows you to make the focus area disappear after establishing a focus lock. I like to see my focus area, so I keep this off. Display Continuous AF Area. If you are in Continuous Autofocus Mode and you are set to Wide or Zone Focus Area, you'll notice little green boxes light up showing you the points that are in focus. This option disables those. Unlike the A6300 and A6500, the phase detection points on the A7R3 do not cover the entire sensor. This option gives you a visual indicator of where the phase detection points end. Note also that if you're in Super 35 mode, you will not see those indicators because the phase detection points do cover the entire area of the Super 35 frame. With a supported lens, the AF micro adjustment will allow you to make fine adjustments to the focus of the lens. For example, if you find that your lens is slightly back focusing despite confirming focus, you can use this to keep your lens on target. In my experience, very few Sony lenses need this, but the option is always there. Page 9, Exposure Settings. Assuming you're not in manual mode and your exposure compensation dial is set to zero, the exposure compensation setting will be available for you to set. I can think of a couple edge cases where I might set this in the menu, but since the camera does have a physical exposure compensation dial, the vast majority of people would be wise to use that instead. Reset Exposure Value Compensation simply clears out any values you put in the previous setting. Alternatively, you can just move the Exposure Compensation dial one click and back again to have the same effect. ISO would typically be set by the physical buttons or function menu, but you can set it here if you hate having extra time in your life. When you are in Aperture Priority, Program Auto, or Intelligent Auto, and ISO is set to Auto, the ISO Auto Minimum Shutter Speed will place limits on how slow of a shutter speed the camera will allow before jacking up the ISO to compensate. I'm not sure if this is a Sony engineer's attempted at humor, but the abbreviation they've chosen for this is ISO-ASS. Setting this to a reasonable speed will prevent motion blur, thus saving your ISO-ASS. Metering mode is another setting you would probably rather get through the function menu or a custom button, but it is here as well. And we'll go through the metering mode options in a later video. Face priority and multi-metering lets the camera ignore the rest of the world and do metering only on the faces it detects, if any. This helps you get a properly exposed face, whether you're in a snowstorm or in a dark venue that would otherwise trip up the camera's default metering. If you're in spot metering mode, this option determines if metering always occurs at the center or if it follows your chosen focus point. Exposure step lets you adjust shutter, aperture, and exposure compensation values by half stops rather than the more common thirds. Just know that the physical exposure compensation dial only works in thirds regardless of the setting. Auto exposure lock with shutter prevents the exposure from changing after the shutter has been pressed halfway down. Auto is only applicable for single shot AF in continuous AF, or when shooting a burst, the exposure will change continuously. To force exposure lock on first focus, set this to on. Also note that the physical AEL button will override any setting here. Exposure standard adjustment changes what the camera believes is quote unquote correct for each metering mode. If you don't know why you're doing it, then don't do it. Basically, the world of exposure is based on 18% gray. There are plenty of YouTube videos on the subject. In changing these settings, you're basically changing what the camera believes 18% gray really is. Changing this is different from using exposure compensation, which is a picture-by-picture -picture choice to add or subtract from the level that the camera has metered. So again, if you don't precisely know what you plan to achieve with these settings, don't change them. 
Flash Off and Flash Auto will only be available if you're in Intelligent Auto mode. In any other mode, they will be grayed out. Fill Flash is your standard always-on flash that triggers with the opening of the shutter. Slow Sync reduces shutter speed to improve the illumination of the background behind your subject. Rear Sync will trigger the flash at the end of a longer exposure so you can have both a bit of motion blur plus a properly exposed subject. This is best done with a bit of additional continuous lighting. Flash Compensation changes the power output of a flash that's in TTL mode. Exposure Compensation Setting By default, exposure compensation will increase or decrease both the ambient light and power output of a flash in TTL mode. So if you want the exposure compensation to only affect ambient light sources, you can separate the two here. I would only change this in very specific scenarios. Wireless Flash By default, the camera will assume there is only one flash and that it is attached to the hot shoe. If you have a lighter radio-based off-camera flash and an appropriate transmitter on the camera, this setting makes the camera aware that off-camera flash is involved and adjusts accordingly. Red-eye reduction will fire the flash a couple times to reduce red-eye. Basically, the first flash causes the pupils to contract so that the second flash is less likely to pick up the red-eye. White balance is something you would normally set by quick menu or custom button, but you can set it here as well. We can skip the standard options, but I want to quickly mention that there are three custom white balance slots. To fill them, you go to the set function, hold up your white balance card so it fills the circle on the screen, and press the center button. The camera will take a picture and ask you which slot to save the setting to. Pretty simple. Priority set in auto white balance. If you are set to auto white balance, this option will tell the camera to favor matching the ambient lighting rather than trying to make white, quote unquote, white. So if you're indoors and you want to keep the nice warm orange glow of the incandescent lighting, this will tell the camera to match the white balance to the tone of the available lighting. The white setting would tend to make the overall image seem like it was taken with white lights. Standard lets the camera decide how best to adjust the color. And again, I would only change this in specific scenarios. DRO and Auto HDR are designed to expand the dynamic range of JPEG images. They do not affect raw images. DRO tries to bring out details in shadows and highlights that would otherwise be lost when saving the JPEG. There are five levels. Auto HDR, on the other hand, is similar to exposure bracketing in that the camera will take three images at different exposures, but in this case, the camera will stitch them together itself. Because it records three successive images, Auto HDR cannot be used with moving subjects, but DRO can. Note that Auto HDR will only be enabled in JPEG only mode. DRO will be enabled in JPEG or RAW plus JPEG mode. Creative styles only affect JPEGs in movies. These are presets that try to emulate different photographic looks by automatically applying a set of filters. For each style, you have a limited amount of control over your contrast, exposure, and sharpening. I'm going to leave this as standard for now, but I do often change this for movie purposes. Picture effects are only available in JPEG only mode. These are highly stylized picture effects similar to using Instagram filters on your phone. Picture profiles are primarily used in videos, but will affect both JPEGs and RAW files as well, so you have to be careful to change or disable this when switching between movie and photo modes. Picture modes are a deep subject that I'll cover in a different video, but they are commonly used by filmmakers to squeeze all of the dynamic range of the camera into a video file. This is pretty similar to how DRO tries to raise the brightness of your shadows and darken the highlights in order to preserve as many details as possible in your JPEG images. Focus magnifier would typically be activated by a physical button and is only available in single shot mode or with a manual lens. This lets you cycle between two levels of magnification in the viewfinder in order to check if your subject is in focus. It is particularly useful with manual lenses, or lenses with very large apertures, uh, in which it's difficult to determine precisely where the focus point is. Focus magnifier time simply lets the camera cancel the magnifier automatically after two or five seconds. I keep this on no limit. By default, when you use the focus magnifier, the screen starts off at a 1x view. This option allows you to start off at a 4x view, but I find that that can be kind of confusing, so I leave it at 1x. Autofocus in Focus Magnifier simply allows you to focus while in magnification mode. In most cases, I like this to be on. If you have an electronic lens but are in manual focus mode, this option will make the Focus Magnifier engage automatically when you twist the focus ring. Focus Speaking is a tool for helping you determine what is and isn't in focus in lieu of an actual autofocus lens. 
It isn't perfect, it simply uses math to find sharp edges and then marks those edges with tiny little dots. There are many ways the process can be fooled. You can turn it on and off, choose how sensitive it is, and pick a color for the indicators. I use a lot of manual lenses, so I keep peeking on, I set it to a low level, and I use the color red. Those who have tried to film with the electronic shutter or with a 1 60th shutter speed under LED street lamps have felt the pain of flicker. When lights cycle at a similar frequency as your shutter rate, you get these weird light and dark patches in your image. Anti-flicker shooting tries to combat that. I turn this on if necessary. Face registration and registered faces priority allows you to save some faces that you would like the camera to recognize and prioritize above other faces. So for example, if you register the bride and groom at a wedding, then you can have the camera prioritize their faces when focusing. We've jumped over to the purple tab and I've put the camera in movie mode since the next couple pages focus on movie options. Starting with exposure mode. And just like the mode dial on the camera has several priority modes for photos, movie mode has its own priority modes, which are accessed here. If you want the camera to do all that it can do to control your exposure, you can leave it in program auto. However, the majority of creators looking for quality output will shoot in manual mode. Now, remember I just said that the next couple pages deal almost exclusively with movie mode, and that is a lie, because Sony, for some reason, shoved S&Q settings into this page. And S&Q is another mode on the camera that has absolutely nothing to do with movie mode. So, the S&Q exposure mode will only show up when you are in S&Q mode. S&Q stands for slow and quick motion. You can record slow and quick motion in other ways, and often you can achieve better quality by doing so, but you'll have to slow down your footage in an editing package like Adobe Premiere. SNQ mode lets you record slower fast motion video that plays in slower fast motion right in the camera. Just like movie mode has priority modes, so does SNQ mode. You must be in SNQ mode to set this option. And I typically leave this to program auto, and I'll tell you why in a few moments. Now back to movie mode. File format lets you choose between XAVCS in 4K, XAVCS in HD, or the old AVC HD format. XAVCS is a superior codec, so unless you have a specific reason to record in AVC HD, I would recommend choosing between one of the XAVCS formats, and I'm going to change this to 4K for now. And changing this to 4K mode exposes one of the irritations of just about every Sony camera that has 4K in it. You can switch to 4K mode, but at that point you lose the ability to display your menus on a remote monitor. So we're actually going to go back into the menus and switch to HD mode. Record settings allows you to change your frame rate and bit rate. And note that if you have two options, the higher of the two bit rates will yield better quality. Also a larger file. If you want something more filmic, uh, choose 24p, and if you would like to do some slow motion effects, uh, 120p at uh, 100 megabits a second is pretty decent quality. Jumping back to S&Q settings, you can choose what your normal frame rate is. We'll set it to 24p, and then you can select what your target frame rate is. In this case, I'll leave it at 120 frames a second. This yields 5x slow motion, which is cool, but note the part that says 12 megabits a second. If you multiply 12 times 5, you get 60 megabits a second. It turns out that SNQ mode will only record at 60 megabits a second. Remember, in movie mode, we had the option to do 120p at 100 megabits a second. So while SNQ mode is very convenient, shooting slow motion in movie mode will get you better quality. So basically, unless I have an emergency need for slow motion, I never use SNQ mode. Movie files can be very large. Proxy recording allows you to record a smaller, low bitrate movie alongside your full-size movie file. This is recorded in XAVCS at 1280 x 720 and 9 megabits a second. This option is not available if you're in AVC HD mode, nor if you are set to record in 120p in HD. AF drive speed lets you control how fast autofocus lenses focus in movie mode. Fast would be more appropriate for following action, while slow would make more smooth focus transitions from one subject to another. AF Track Sense lets you control lock-on tracking in movie mode. Responsive will help in tracking a subject moving quickly across the frame, while Standard will help in maintaining a track when your subject briefly disappears behind another object. Auto Slow Shutter works only in Program Auto or Aperture Priority movie modes, and only when ISO is set to Auto. 
This will cause the camera to favor a slower shutter instead of a higher ISO in dark locations, so instead of more noise, you'll get more motion blur. Now, since I shoot in manual mode, this setting doesn't really affect me, but given the choice, I would rather have noisy footage than blurry footage because noise is easier to deal with in post. Audio recording will capture audio in your movie files from the internal microphone or an external microphone if detected. Audio recording level is self-explanatory. If you are recording voices, I would suggest having the subject speak while you adjust levels until the peaks hit about minus 12 on the dB meter. Audio level display just lets you make sure that your audio levels appear on your screen in movie mode like so. When using headphones to monitor your audio levels, audio out timing will determine whether the audio is sent to you live or in sync with the video. Wind noise reduction is a low cut filter for the internal microphone only. I've searched, but I can't find where the low cut starts, so I'll just assume it's in the neighborhood of 100 hertz. Marker display lets you show various guidelines on your movie recording screen to assist with framing. Marker settings lets you choose which markers to display. Center gives you some crosshairs. Aspect gives you framing lines for a given aspect ratio in case you want to crop your footage in post to correspond with cinematic ratios. Safety zones used to be a thing with analog CRT-based TVs. If you put information outside the safe frame, there was a good chance it would be cut off on a viewer's TV screen. Guide frames look sort of like the rule of thirds grid, but it's not. It's technically there to judge whether things are either level or plumb relative to the camera plane. Video light mode is designed exclusively for the Sony HVL LBPC LED light. These options allow the camera to control when the light turns on and off. Movie with shutter allows you to use the shutter button to start recording a video in movie or SQ mode. When this is on, you cannot focus with a half press of the shutter button, so you might consider using back button focus or continuous focus if you turn this on. One of the advantages of mirrorless cameras is the ability to shoot silently. In silent shooting mode, the physical shutter stays open all the time, so there's no shutter clap. In fact, silent shooting is closer to video mode than photo mode, and it shares one critical drawback, which is rolling shutter. Unlike the Sony A9, you can't really shoot action in silent shooting mode on any other Sony camera. Basically, if you're shooting a subject that's moving fast enough that you would want to shoot faster than 1 30th or 1 60th of a second, it's advisable to turn silent shooting off. E front curtain shutter. Now, without going into too much detail, there are two shutters in your camera, a front and a rear. They open and close sequentially to take a picture, normally. Now, over time, the front curtain has become largely irrelevant, so Sony disables it by default in favor of the electronic front curtain shutter. There are reasons why you may want to disable the electronic front curtain shutter, usually with high speed photography. And uh, if you take a picture, if you take a high speed picture with a lot of background blur, you may notice that your bokeh gets cut off at the bottom. So your, your nice circular bokeh balls uh, wind up with a flat bottom. That's a good indication that you should probably turn off the e-front shutter and just allow the shutters to do their job. Release without lens and release without card do exactly what you might expect. They allow you to take a picture without a lens attached or a card inserted. And if you plan to use a vintage lens or really any lens that doesn't have uh, electronic contacts, you need to have release without lens enabled. On the other hand, I tend to disable release without card because there's a solid chance I may pick up the camera, fire a hundred shots, and not realize that I didn't record anything. Steady shot will enable or disable stabilization in the camera body, as well as for any Sony lens lens that doesn't have a dedicated switch for it. In steady shot settings, you can let the camera adjust stabilization automatically by setting this to auto. However, if you're using a non-electronic lens, you will need to set this to manual and then set the focal length to the focal length of the lens that you're using. If you switch between Sony lenses and manual lenses a lot, it's easy to forget this setting, so train yourself to remember. This setting tells the camera how strongly to react to your movements. Note that the camera has 5-axis image stabilization built in, and it works pretty well. But lenses typically are better at handling pitch and yaw, so when you attach a stabilized lens to this camera, the camera will allow the lens to handle those two axes while the camera handles the other three. Zoom will only be available in movie mode or in JPEG-only photo modes. If you have a power zoom lens, this can control the optical zoom, and if you have clear image or digital zoom turned on, you can also use those here. In zoom settings, you have three modes, optical only, clear image zoom, and digital zoom. Now, 
One of the cool things about having a 42 megapixel sensor is that there's a lot of pixels you don't need when capturing 4K movies or smaller JPEG images that can't store all those pixels. In Super 35 mode, the camera is actually capturing 5K and then squeezing it down to 4K. So instead of squeezing, we can just crop off those extra pixels. This simulates zooming in, but with no loss of quality. That's the principle behind clear image zoom and lets you extend the zoom range of a zoom lens or even turn a prime lens into a zoom lens. I generally always have this turned on. Now this is technically the same as smart zoom, which is what Sony calls the technology applied to small and medium JPEG images. On the other hand, digital zoom is the more traditional quality killing digital zoom that we're all familiar with from our cell phones. Zoom ring rotate. With a power zoom lens, this lets you reverse the direction of the zoom based on the direction you rotate the ring, but I think most people are used to the righty tidy method. Display button allows you to control what gadgets show up on the monitor or viewfinder with each press of the display button. So in this case, we have several options selected. And as you can see, when we go into the get out of the menu and I hit the display button, it cycles through those same options. Finder monitor allows you to force the monitor or viewfinder on at all times or let the camera switch automatically when your eye approaches the viewfinder. Uh, this is disabled right now because I am sending the HDMI signal out to a recorder. Viewfinder frame rate allows you to increase the refresh in your viewfinder and I've never found a good reason not to have it set to high. Zebra setting. This is more important in video and JPEG modes, but zebras are little lines that show you areas that are too bright and would likely clip in your final images. You can set the sensitivity here. Grid line lets you display one of three grids over your monitor or viewfinder. You get rule of thirds, square grid, or diagonals, and this helps with your framing. Exposure settings guide is sort of an extra graphical element that will show you your f-stop and ISO. Uh, if I turn that on and then I adjust my f-stop, uh, you can see that it comes up in a much larger display rather than just showing me the numbers at the bottom. I don't have any particular need for this, so I just leave it off. Live view display tells the camera to either show you the actual exposure based on your current settings, including creative styles and picture profiles, or to automatically adjust the exposure so that you can clearly see an image on your monitor. Turning this off can be very useful for composing long exposure shots, astro shots, or anything else in a dark environment. Continuous shoot length will show you a meter, letting you know how much longer you can continuously shoot at the same frame rate based on how full the camera's cache currently is. You have the option to always display it or only display it when you start shooting. Auto review displays the last image taken for the selected amount of time before returning to the live view. Custom keys are what make me wish this camera had more buttons. You can assign just about any function to any button and different functions for movie mode and playback mode. This is a deep subject and I'll be back with a video of my favorite configurations, but for the purpose of this video, let me show you a couple things. There are certain functions you can only assign to a dial, while most functions can be assigned to any button. But if you recall earlier in this video, we talked about recall custom hold. This is where you assign your custom hold to the button of your choice. So now when I hit my C1 button, you can see that my settings instantly change. I can take a picture and then jump right back to my normal settings. The function menu is the menu that comes up when you hit the FN button. You can assign up to 10 functions to the menu. If you don't like the arrangement of the aperture and shutter dials, you can reverse them here or reverse their directions here. Dial exposure value compensation is probably not necessary here because there's already a physical dial, but you have the option to reassign exposure to the front or rear dials. The movie button determines whether you can hit the movie button anytime or only in movie mode. Lock operation parts allows you to lock the dials and joystick on the camera when you hold the FN button. You have a few choices of what will be disabled, but buttons will always remain active. And finally, audio signals turns on and off the focus confirmation beeps. All right, let's hop over to the network settings, which are on the green tab. And first we have send to smartphone function. Now you have the ability to send pictures from your camera to your phone. First, you'll need to download the Sony Play Memories app on your phone. And after that, click the send to smartphone function. You'll have the option to choose which pictures to send to your phone by either selecting them on the camera or on the phone. And I highly recommend 
choosing them on the phone because it's a much easier interface to deal with. Once selected, the camera will bring up a QR code you can read from your phone to establish a Wi-Fi Direct connection to the camera. After that, you'll see a list of thumbnails on your phone and some options for which ones to download. Now, if you choose to transfer movies, the sending target allows you to either send only proxy movies or original or original and proxy. Remember that movie files can get very, very large, so you might want to take it easy and just send proxies or just don't send movies to your phone. Send to computer lets you transfer pictures to your computer over USB. You have to select the card that you want to use first, and your USB connection needs to be set to MTP mode, which we'll get to later in this video. The FTP transfer function is pretty obvious. You can enter in the information for FTP servers here, and if you don't know what an FTP server is, you probably won't ever use this. View on TV lets you send pictures to a Miracast receiver. In my case, I have a Roku that'll do the job. Control with smartphone lets you remote control some of the features on your camera using the Play Memories app. The Always Connected option keeps the camera waiting for a connection so you can quickly reconnect with your phone. The downside is that this option consumes more power, so use with caution. Airplane mode disables all radios in the camera the same way it does for your cell phone. Wi-Fi settings lets you connect to a wireless router or display the camera's wireless MAC address. Bluetooth settings lets you pair a device, like a cell phone, to the camera. The camera can then use this device for embedding GPS coordinates in your image. Location information link settings, assuming you've paired your phone to the camera over Bluetooth, you can add location info, correct your camera's time, as well as the area. Edit device name changes the name displayed when you connect to the camera. Import root certificate may be necessary in the rare case that the camera needs to connect securely to a service that uses a certificate that's not part of the camera's default set of certificates. If you need this, you probably have an IT support person telling you that you need it, or you are an IT support person. Reset network settings is self-explanatory. Jumping to the blue playback tab, the protect option lets you mark some or all of your pictures so they cannot be deleted on accident when reviewing files in the camera. This does not protect them from being erased by formatting the card, nor when the SD card is connected to a PC. Rotate and delete should be obvious. Rating allows you to rate your photos with one to five stars. These ratings will be embedded in the EXIF information and read by applications like Lightroom or Capture One. If you've assigned ratings to a custom key, you can select the number of stars the keys can cycle through. So, you may prefer just to have one, three, and five star ratings, or just one star to indicate a keeper. It all depends on how you prefer to work. Specify printing marks images for later printing. This does not work for raw pictures or movies. Copy lets you copy images from one SD card to the other. Obviously, this is an option that's only available when you have two cards in the camera. Photo Capture lets you grab a still frame from a movie, and obviously you have to be in movie mode to use that. There is a physical button for Enlarge Image, but you can activate it here for the last image captured. Enlarge Initial Magnification sets how far Enlarge Image will zoom by default. Enlarge Initial Position sets the location of enlargement when using Enlarge Image. Slideshow does what the name implies. You have the option to repeat after all the images have played or start over automatically. You can also set the interval between images. Slideshow does what the name implies. You have the option to repeat after all the images have played or start over automatically. You can also set the interval between the images. Select Playback Media selects the card that will be accessed when viewing your images in playback mode. View Mode lets you filter the playback images by date, folder, or video types. Image Index determines how many images will be displayed in the Image Index. Displaying 25, of course, will mean that the thumbnails will be very tiny. Display Continuous Shoot Group. If you shoot a continuous burst of images, this will group those images in the Image Index rather than showing each one, and I like to have this on. Display Rotation toggles whether the screen will automatically rotate based on its orientation or require manual intervention or disable rotation entirely. Image Jump tells the camera which dial you want to use to cycle through your images faster and how many images to skip when using the selected dial. This helps you move faster through your image index. All right, into the yellow Settings tab. Monitor Brightness gives you two options, Manual Control or Maximum Brightness, which they call Sunny Weather. In Manual Mode, you'll have five levels of brightness, and Sunny Weather is a sixth level of brightness, and I can't show you that right now because it is disabled when I've got the HDMI out. Viewfinder Brightness also gives you two options, Automatic and Manual. Manual will give you the same five levels of brightness available in Monitor Brightness. Finder Color Temperature gives you a few levels of color temperature offset in the Viewfinder. 
For those shooting video in log formats, the monitor will normally look very low contrast and gray. It can be very difficult to know if your footage is exposed correctly, or how it will look after it's graded, or even if it's in focus. Gamma Display Assist will let you see more natural looking colors in the monitor. This does not affect the recorded files, it's just an approximation so you have a better idea of what you're capturing. Volume setting determines how loud the system beeps and the movie playback will be. Delete confirmation tells the camera whether to highlight, cancel, or delete by default. There are two levels of display quality, standard and high, and I always prefer high. Power save start time sets the delay between the last activity you did with the camera and when it enters power save mode. You can go for as long as 30 minutes. Auto power off temperature. Sony cameras have historically had overheating issues, particularly when recording video for long periods of time. This setting relaxes the camera's thermal limits to reduce the likelihood of overheating. Now, the A7R 3 has not shown a tendency to overheat, but let's wait until July to confirm that. NTSC PAL selector lets you switch your video frame rates from the American NTSC standards to the European ones. Cleaning mode tells the camera to shake the sensor in the camera very, very quickly to hopefully shake off any dust particles which may have fallen on it. Touch operation enables or disables the camera's touchscreen, and I like to have this on. There are two modes for the touchscreen. The first is touch panel mode, which lets you touch to focus the monitor when the monitor is on. The other mode is touch pad, which is active when you look through the viewfinder and the monitor is off. In this mode, the touchscreen acts like a trackpad on a laptop. As you move your finger around, the focus point will move in the viewfinder. In touchpad settings, you can select whether the touchpad works in vertical orientation. Touch position mode will determine if the focus point will jump to the position of your finger exactly, or if it will move relative to the motion of your finger as you slide around on the screen. And finally, since it's difficult to use the full width of the touchscreen when your face is squashed against it, looking through the viewfinder, this option lets you shrink the active area so your finger stays out of your way. Demo mode is for salespeople. TCUB settings. The A7R 3 will accept timecode from a remote source. Filmmakers use a timecode generator to match timecode between cameras and audio recorders so they match up in post. Remote control toggles whether the camera will respond to an infrared remote or not. HDMI settings let you configure the camera's HDMI video output. You can force it to a particular resolution and frame rate, whether the camera's information icons display over HDMI, and by the way, that will not work when recording 4K movies. Uh, whether you get timecode output, uh, record control will let a remote video recorder like a Blackmagic or Atomos uh, to force the camera to start recording use the re using the record button on the recorder. 4K output selection determines whether or not you can record to the memory card while sending video out. USB connection lets you choose how the USB connection functions when attached to a computer. Mass storage makes the camera act like a flash drive. MTP is for media transfer, and PC Remote lets a program on your computer, like Capture One or Sony's Imaging Edge, control the camera for tethered shooting. USB LUN setting is a very rarely used option. If you're having trouble establishing a USB connection with it set to multi, switch it to single. Otherwise, it should pretty much always be set to multi. USB power supply lets the camera charge by USB, and this will work with either the USB-C or micro USB. And no, you cannot power the entire camera over USB, the battery must still be in the camera. PC remote settings determines whether or not the camera will also save images when you're doing tethered shooting, and what kind of images will be sent. Language is pretty obvious. Date and time setup is also obvious. Area settings should have been called time zone, but you get the idea. Copyright info embeds your copyright info into the EXIF data of your images. I recommend everyone fill this out in addition to using other methods to protect your images. This can do a little to help establish ownership should someone steal your images online. Format is self-explanatory. It is, however, worth noting that flash memory remains at its fastest when you format your cards rather than just deleting the images. There's a technical reason for that we'll go into another time. File number lets you reset the sequential numbering to zero. Set file name lets you set the prefix for naming your images. The file name will be the file name plus the file number. Since the A7R 3 has dual memory cards, recording media settings gives you a few options on where to save your files. You can choose which card to prioritize. Then you can choose whether you want to record to both cards simultaneously or sort images between the cards. Now I'm going to skip to new folder which creates a new folder on my SD card. And now when I go to select record folder, 
I have a new option where I can start sending my pictures that are taken from this moment on. Now, folder name will allow you to have the camera automatically create folders based on the date, and I prefer this option. Now, rarely the image database on an SD card can become corrupted. This option helps you recover it to get things working again. Display Media Info displays how many images or how many minutes you can capture based on the card currently in the selected slot. Version simply shows you the firmware for the camera and the lens in use. Setting Reset has two options. Camera Settings Reset just takes the camera back to default, while Initialize takes the camera back to its out-of-box state, clearing the clock and everything. And you've made it to the last, the My Menu Settings. This allows you to set up up to five pages of only the settings you want and in the order you want. So simply hit Add Item, find something you want to put on a page, we'll go with JPEG Image Size, and we'll add it to My Menu 1. If you want to add another option, let's hit APC, ASP, uh, APSC. Now that's added. Let's pick something else. Focus mode, and we'll put this on menu three. So now in my menu, I have my menu one, and I have my menu three, with only the settings I want to see. I should note that these are embedded into the camera and not on the SD card. Well, if you made it, you are a person of unique perseverance. So hit that subscribe button, and we'll do something a little more interesting next time.